the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now, here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney, and today, David, our guest, looking more at the political side of the Chinese question, is Min Chen Pei. Well, juxtaposed against such massive and largely positive economic and social changes, however, is China's political system. Despite more than two decades of rapid socioeconomic changes, the core features of a Leninist party state remain essentially unchanged. The pace of political change has significantly lagged behind that of economic progress. Mention this is what you penned several years ago. You wrote this and basically we're trying to frame that yes, there is a way forward economically in terms of the reforms that need to take place in China, economic reforms, but there are a number of political barriers, the Chinese political system itself even. And that's where we'd like to start today, just kind of with, with an exploration. I think in past weeks we've covered China and its economic challenges, your background, professor of government, Claremont McKenna today, before that, professor of politics at Princeton, and the scholarly works that you've done both on you know, the demise of communism in China and the Soviet Union, and more recently, your book, China's Trapped Transition, The Limits of Developmental Autocracy. You deal specifically with the politics embedded in this issue. Maybe we can start there. Oh, yes, absolutely. I think... People who look at China economic growth often forget that at the end of the day, what determines policy is political power, not economic rationality. What is economically desirable is not always politically desirable. And that appears to be a blind spot a lot of people have when we look at China, and I will also say look at many other countries. Well, we've got the semi-market-based economies, the quote-unquote hybrids, the mixed command and market characteristics of, say, Singapore, Beijing, Moscow, maybe even Caracas, and they've flourished in a certain financial environment. Globalization has opened fresh opportunities. Credit has flowed freely in the past 30 years. And as Michael Pettis has argued, if you take away credit, and you begin to reverse the progress that comes with globalization, and again, this is sort of the liquidity theories explored by Minsky and Kendallberger, might we have a very different opinion of the Chinese economic miracle or these other autocratically directed market-oriented economies, again, if credit was tightening and globalization trends thereby moved in reverse, is it the system or is it these global liquidity flows that are helping any and all systems? Well, I would say that global liquidity flows are certainly part of this picture, but not the only part of this picture of globalization. I would say if you look at China's economic growth for the last uh, 30 years, the role of credit played a far more important role inside China rather than between China and the rest of the world. The money that flows out of China, of course, helps sustain Western demand for China's consumer goods. That helps. But it was not the sole driver. I think the sole driver in the West is the explosion of credit. But there is a similar explosion of credit inside China that played a very critical role in helping the Chinese government finance trillions of dollars in infrastructure. Spending. I would modify your point a little bit. I think credit flows are important. Global credit flow flows are very important for the last two decades. But the China story is essentially a domestic credit boom. And in its relationship with the rest of the world is that China was willing, uh, actually China found that it was in its interest to recycle its export earnings abroad in the form of reverse credit flows to the developed country, in essentially paying Americans for purchasing China's goods. Well, and that's one of the many issues we'd like to explore is the impact on the U.S. Treasury market. And you know, if the Chinese trade and investment reorientation, if that will in fact have an impact on demand for treasuries. Oh, I would say if China's export growth slows down, if China starts to run 
a trade deficit, you are going to see the treasury market severely affected because China will at least not be in the market to purchase more issues. In fact, China will very likely sell some of its holdings to pay for current account deficits. Right now, China still enjoys current account surplus, but China's merchandise trade account uh, is showing less and less of a surplus. Uh, in some months, it actually registered a deficit. So we can conceive of a period sometime in the next five to ten years when China's current account surplus could become a deficit account rather than a surplus account. And by that time, of course, there will be a huge source of demand for U.S. treasuries will dry up. For most investors, they look at the purchase of any asset as, in fact, an investment. What is my rate of return going to be on this particular investment? And there's concern over whether or not you make money or lose money. Is it fair to assume that there's more of a political calculus involved in the purchase of treasuries on behalf of or, or, or on the part of, of the Chinese? Not necessarily. I think uh, politics plays a very uh, insignificant role in China's decision to purchase the treasuries. In fact, they would love to purchase less. <laughs> Purchasing more would mean that they have effectively tied their future income, future returns to American uh, fiscal and monetary policies. Uh, and if you are a great power, you don't want to do this. But if you look at the economic calculations, they make a lot more sense. There are not really a lot of other assets the Chinese can put their export earnings into. And I think for the past few years, they've done very well in getting to the treasury because the treasury markets have boomed. Uh, <laughs> the rate dropped from 4% a few years ago to now 1.5% on the Payin bond. And the Chinese are sitting on a lot of capital gains. Of course, these capital gains are offset by depreciation of the US dollar against the Chinese currency. But by and large, I would say they extremely conservative when it comes to investing their foreign currency earnings. We have the idea of the Washington consensus, which is that there is a liberal Western democracy with all these sort of institutions and norms that come with it that can be used as a model for any country seeking to advance their prospects in the global community. And then there's the Beijing consensus, if you want to call it that, which is more of a an acknowledgement that authoritarianism mixed with the market economy works and has been legitimized by the success story witnessed in China today. Would you come to that conclusion? Is this a success story or are there things that we're overlooking in that appraisal or as folks have written about the Beijing consensus, is there something that's missing there in that analysis? Yeah, I would say if I'm very charitable, if I'm in a very good mood today, I would say at best, <laughs> China's economic story is a mixed story. There are pluses and minuses. We can go into that later on. If you look at the plus side of the Chinese economy and you want to explain what's responsible for China's achievements in those areas, and let me just take them off. A very rapid reduction in poverty, largely through economic growth. Then you would say, well, for some time, they act, the Chinese government actually followed the Washington consensus. So what is the Washington consensus? The key components, liberalizing trade, especially liberalizing trade with the outside world. So China's foreign trade boomed. China utilized its comparative advantage, which is cheap labor. Another Washington consensus is a fiscally conservative. China's government has been relatively conservative in borrowing money explicitly. In the debt to GDP, if you measure China's sovereign debt, is relatively low, 20% of GDP. So that uh, inflation gets under control. That's another Washington consensus. And then the Washington consensus also says the government should provide a key infrastructure for building. So that's what China has done. So in other words, what China has done is in line with the Washington consensus. And also, I would say that in 
this process, China has very powerful tailwinds. So what are the tailwinds in China? We're talking about a very young population, 20 years ago. So for the last 30 years, China enjoyed something uh, called the demographic dividend. That is, a lot of young people, not a lot of old, retired people. So the country did not have to spend a lot on health care, on retirement. The savings can be plowed back into building factories and roads. That's why China has very modern factories and roads. So that's one. But if you look at the downside, is that it's a mixed story, as I said. Well, in this process, China actually has not been very uh, effective in fighting the corruption in the government. Uh, has not been effective in delivering social services. So environmental degradation is very serious. Health care is becoming a huge problem inside China. It's expensive. It does not have a lot of... A lot of people do not have access to this. It's of low quality. And if you look at the sustainability of growth, also there's a huge question mark because China in the last 20 years pioneered, well, follow the so-called East Asian model, which is investment-driven model, export-driven model. And now this model is coming to its end. So it's, at best, a very mixed story. Well, so if they followed a model which is consistent with the Washington consensus, then the Beijing consensus really is is not much of a story to speak of. It, it, their success has had less to do with autocracy or authoritarianism and more to do with the things that you just mentioned, reduction in poverty, liberalizing trade, fiscal conservatism, keeping inflation under control, investing in key infrastructure, and things of that nature. With a major transition afoot, perhaps you can frame for the listener the importance of the most recent 12th year plan, and then contrast the constraints that leadership is under with their stated intentions of reform. Well, frankly, I think most Chinese or Chinese analysts do not pay attention to the 12, five-year plan. But things of this are produced for official consumption and propaganda. They may reflect uh, desired goals of the Chinese government, but the achievement of these plans is always suspect. So based on what I know about the desired goals of the Chinese government, and I'm sure they are spelled out in the plan, the Chinese government would like to bring the economy more or less into balance, which means it wants to have more consumption by Chinese households. Right now, Chinese households consume only 35% of GDP, the lowest of a major economy. The U.S., by contrast, consumers in the U.S. account for household consumption accounts for about 70% of GDP, so double the Chinese rate. Uh, and of course, to offset that, you have to bring down investment in China. So what's wrong with investment? Because investment in China can produce a, a lot of excess capacity, new factories that produce things that nobody would buy, highways, ports that have very little usage, utilization. So that's a waste. It does improve your growth numbers in the short run. Well, it improves your growth numbers in the short run because when you spend the money exactly. to put stuff on the ground, if you dig a hole, it comes as... If you pay somebody to dig the hole, that's GDP. <laughs> the Chinese government will also like to reduce environmental degradation because the environment in China has suffered egregiously in the last three decades. So they've got to roll back. And the Chinese people are not willing to breathe very hazardous air day in and day out. And also they are very worried about China's competitiveness in a wide range of technology sectors. So they want to make the country more competitive. Uh, all desired goals. But whether can they do this? I'm very skeptical. I think the problem with China, and that goes back to the so-called Washington consensus, the Beijing consensus, very ironically, if you want to explain China's success, the Washington consensus does a very good job explaining it. If you want to explain China's failure, then the failure all comes from its authoritarian political system. In other words, autocratic politics is holding back China. China would have become a much more dynamic, efficient uh, economy that benefits its people more 
had its politics been different. Let's digress for a moment to the territorial issues of the Ryukyu Islands, the Parcel Spratly Islands, the, the Mischief Rocks, and generally the South China Sea. I mean, regionally, there are reasons for Chinese leadership to be resisted. The Philippines, Vietnam, Singapore, Taiwan, Japan, Malaysia, Indonesia, they all have interests at stake in these geographic disputes. Does this compromise China's ability to lead regionally using soft power, let's call it that? Oh, absolutely. I think China's problem with its neighbors is that China is simply too big. Too big, and its neighbors are frightened of China's power. And also, of course, what complicates is that China has maritime disputes with Vietnam, Japan, the Southeast Asia, and China's positions on these disputes have been quite firm. I think that the Diaoyu Island or Senkaku Island with Japan, that's a special case. I think uh, that issue probably, if you look at, if you consult international lawyers, they would say the Japanese have a weaker case. But on the South China Sea, China has a weaker case in most of the disputed areas. That does not mean that other countries have a watertight case as well. But what bothers the other countries in the South China dispute is that China is unwilling to change its negotiating position. Right now, China says, we're going to negotiate only with individual countries on a bilateral level. We're not going to hold an international conference to solve the issue. And China does not invoke the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which will put China's position at significant disadvantage. So that bothers people as well. So I think if, if, if China wants to reassure its neighbors, it has to give up a lot of its territorial aspirations. Uh, otherwise, I think its neighbors will have all kinds of reasons to be very close to the U.S. because they alone or even collectively cannot constrain China, cannot make China behave responsibly. So they have to bring in Uncle Sam to balance against China. And maybe that's what we see today in U.S. foreign policy, as U.S. foreign policy makers appear to be buttressing Indian and Japanese relations, uh, You know, again, with some emphasis on regional Asian countries, going back to the South China Sea example. Is there anything that U.S. policy makers should do to recalibrate these more or less aggressive postures, or is this just what it takes to sort of offset the Chinese Leviathan, they're now so big and so powerful that this is just our way of holding that balance of power in Asia. Yeah. First, let me clarify that even without territorial disputes, the U.S. will be involved. What the territorial disputes have done is to make the door even wider for the U.S. to come in, make the U.S. presence or the U.S. re deployment of its military assets more welcome to people in the region. I think what the U.S. needs to be careful is that its primary goal has two components. One is deterrence, that is to make it sure to China that in its disputes with its neighbors, it should think twice, if not three times, before it uses force. There's another much bigger guy on the block now. So that's deterrence. The other component of the American strategy is balance. That is, it will not allow a single country to dominate that part of the world. So if it's China, the U.S. will be friends with Japan, India, and so forth. If it's some other country, the U.S. will be friends with China to counterbalance. So that's the U.S. underlying strategy. Now, in doing this, the U.S. has to be very careful about one thing. It does not want to be used by those countries involved in the disputes because their objectives are very different. They want to bring the U.S. in in order to enhance their positions against China, which is fully understandable. But they may not want to avoid conflict with China because sometimes they miscalculate as well. For example, Vietnam. It wants the U.S. to be in Cameron Bay to increase its military presence. In the meantime, Vietnam uh, has purchased diesel submarines, fighter aircraft from Russia. What if Vietnam gets into a fight 
with China by some accident. How will the U.S. respond? So the U.S. has to be e- extremely cautious in maintaining a balance between its strategy and avoiding getting directly involved in territorial disputes. Let's come back to the economic issues and the rebalancing which needs to take place in in China. Some analysts have taken the sort of economic bearish case on China, and and they cite a looming debt crisis. It exaggerated this by loose provincial lending and in almost a form of shadow banking where unofficial channels and special purpose vehicles have been used to extend credit, uh, again, non-traditionally. But by doing so, they've increased the inherent risk in the financial system. I guess one of the questions that lingers for us is, in your view, is there a debt crisis looming for China? And when you look at non-performing loans in an environment like China, is there something really to even worry about? They can always be evergreened or perhaps with a banking system that's controlled by the state. Maybe non-performing loans can simply be ignored. Well, there is a debt crisis looming in China, but this is a debt crisis for local governments, for real estate developers, for the railway system, which has borrowed too much money and probably cannot repay. For China as a nation, there is no debt crisis. In other words, China is still solvent as a nation. Uh, it does not owe its net international position, investment position, is still positive. And it was very little in terms of sovereign debt to the outside. The problem with China is that if the current trends continue for another five years, then the nation itself will become bankrupt because it can't afford to bail out local governments and various debtors maybe once, one more time, but not two more times or three more times. So that's the problem for the medium term, but not for the immediate term. When we think of the organizations which have dominated the business community in China, the the state-owned enterprises, are they an example of Chinese success in business? Or in your opinion, do these state-owned enterprises grow at the expense of other areas within the economy? Oh, they're not examples of success. They are actual examples of failure of the Chinese economic model. Because if you look at these state-owned enterprises, you find two things. One is that most of them are not very profitable or competitive. And those that are very profitable are monopolies like China Mobile, big Chinese banks. And their profits will evaporate if you introduce market competition. They survive by gouging Chinese customers who had to endure high prices and low quality in terms of service. And most of the other state-owned enterprises that are in some sort of semi-competitive sectors, they cannot survive without access to cheap credit or free capital by the state. I've seen academic studies that show that if they get their cheap credit, tax subsidies, or monopoly rent taken away, they will all be losing money. Well, and this has a similar echo to what we have here in the United States, that there are a number of sectors which, without cheap capital, would not be surviving. And the issue is that cheap capital comes at some cost. It's cheap to the person receiving it, but it's drawing resources from elsewhere in the economy and essentially creating a subsidy. It's a repression of the household sector, a tax, an additional tax on the household sector. And this brings up this problem with reform in the Chinese economy because on the one hand, if the five-year goal, even if they can't pursue those goals, you know, their desired goals, but, but the achievement of them is unlikely, what you have is the household sector, which will continue to be repressed in favor of the state-owned enterprises, unless, of course, the state-owned enterprises are privatized or competition is allowed. That's very difficult, isn't it, when you consider that the old guard has benefits which are being conferred via this sort of rent extraction? I mean, the key sectors in the economy are benefiting the most powerful people in the country. And they don't have to be efficient to basically be skimming profits and cash flow from the larger economy. Am I making sense with them? Absolutely. I think you identified a key problem with the Chinese economy. That is, state-owned enterprises get cheap capital, largely at the expense of households. Chinese households suffer from another hidden tax, the tax on their deposits. Economists calculate that tax amounts to about 4 to 5% of GDP. 
So every year, four to five percent of GDP goes into state-owned enterprises in terms of subsidies. And taking away the subsidy is very difficult politically because why do state-owned enterprises exist? There are many political reasons for the Chinese government, which tends to think that state-owned enterprises are strategic. They simply cannot trust capitalists, domestic foreign, to provide China's telecom services, financial services, or explore China's natural resources. They just don't have that trust. And secondly, state enterprises constitute a huge patronage machine. If you are a child of a Communist Party official, you can get a very good job in a state enterprise. All he needs to do is to ask his dad or relatives to uh, help him get this position. So in other words, if you Get rid of state enterprises. How are you going to take care of the children, the relatives, or the officials themselves? So that's why it's extremely difficult politically to change the status quo. Well, let's go to some specific points that you've made in your book, China's Trapped Transition, The Limits of Developmental Autocracy. You've written that few authoritarian regimes can rely on coercion alone to maintain power. This is the point you were just making. Most autocracies mix coercion with patronage to secure support from key constituencies, such as the bureaucracy, the military, and business groups. Let's talk a little bit more about patronage, how it works, and the limits that that places on economic reforms. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, let me just talk about business groups, because this is uh, something the outside world may not be aware of very clearly. If you're a private entrepreneur, or if you're a group of private entrepreneurs, you also want the government to take care of you. So how do you take care of the government? You want to reassure the government that you're not going to allow free labor unions in your factories, and that the government will, ha- will be very happy to help you <laughs> make sure that happens, right? And then you also want the government to g- maintain low currency because your main products are for exports. So cheap currency helps you. And in return, you're not going to criticize the government. You're not going to organize yourselves to become an independent political lobby. So there is this quid pro quo. So that's patronage. And of course, on the individual level, if you're a college graduate in China and you really want this very nice job in a state-owned bank or in a bureaucracy, so the first thing you want to do is to join the Communist Party. Because that is like pledging your political allegiance. I'm not going to make political trouble. So please give me this good job. And here's my application for party membership. So that's how political patronage works in China. Well, you know, addressing the issue of rampant uh, official corruption, uh, you say that partially reformed economic and political institutions provide a fertile environment for official corruption because institutional rules are either unclear or politically unforceable in such environments. Rough estimates of the total cost of corruption, as you've noted in your book, range from 4% to 17% of GDP, which is a substantial amount of resources diverted from public coffers to private pockets. Now, just to illustrate, in dollar terms, we're talking about a range in the Chinese economy of $239 billion if we're taking current GDP statistics. Yeah. Minimum of $239 billion to upwards of $1.1 trillion yes. in bribes, financial fraud, purchase of land, you know, illegal real estate transactions, the purchase or sale of government appointments. <laughs> These are huge numbers. Yeah. Again, when you look at a system that has endemic corruption and we read something like the World Bank's report on economic reform and sort of the road map for China from the 1978 period through 2030. Here, very simplistically, are the economic reforms that need to be put in place. And yet you have these barriers to reform, whether it's corruption or we were just talking about patronage, the subsidies to the state-owned enterprises. I mean, these are the things that make up a large percentage of the Chinese economy. How do you get vested interests to simply walk away from those interests? Well, I think traditionally there are two ways to deal with that. One is to throw them out 
That's the revolution. You have something like Arab Spring or the Soviet class, the revolution in Indonesia, that threw out those parasites in the system. Very costly, and sometimes these elites can come back. <laughs> or another group of elites will come back and take over their position. So it may not be successful. And a second way would be to buy them out. That is, we know you have accumulated a lot of uh, ill-gotten wealth. What we want you to do is to get out of those sectors. We're not going to get your wealth back, but you're not going to be allowed to keep being parasites, <laughs> to continue to be parasites on the economic system. So you cut their access to future profits from economic activities. So that's why I don't know what China will do or can do, but one thing we know is that if it does not do the second option, that is buying them out through some sort of one-time bribery, then we're looking down at the other path, that is a revolution that can overthrow all of these rent-seekers or parasites in the economic system. Well, this brings us back to the issue of does the Politburo have the political courage to take these steps, or are they more inclined to just let things play out gradually? I mean, as we talked a few weeks ago, wait, 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 talk, 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 that's more of their operating strategy, even if they set forward ideals and a roadmap for people to look at and admire and assume that they're acting on, when in fact they maybe do nothing. Yeah, well, I see, I think, still wait, 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 talk, 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 and do nothing. Because China today has a very weak leadership at the very top. So Politburo, 25 people, or Politburo Standing Committee, 9 people, they cannot make a fundamentally different decision. What happened in the past in China is that if you are in a survival mode, if the regime is in survival mode, then you can think more creatively, more courageously, and do something major. But right now, I just don't see the stars lined up for the Chinese government to do something that will represent a dramatic break with the past. So if the ruling elite loses confidence in the future of the regime, essentially there is that wait, 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 talk, talk, talk. What do you think the behavior of the ruling elite will become when they realize that the regime is near its end? Maybe it's five years out, maybe it's 10 years out, maybe it's two years out. How do you think their behavior will be impacted? Would you describe that as another one of the quote-unquote 59 phenomenon, which you allude to in your book? Yeah, 59 phenomenon in China is that because most officials retire at the age of 60, and by the age they are 59, they become very corrupt. They take all kinds of bribes and try to hide their ill-gotten wealth. That's the 59 phenomenon. I would say that if nothing changes and... The members of the ruling elite clearly understand the risks of the system. They see crisis coming before most other people can see it. What that means is that in, before these risks become overwhelming or before a crisis is very visible, these members, these ruling elites will most likely hedge. That is, they will send their children abroad, send their wives, mistresses abroad, establish a residence, move some money out while they continue to collect bribes in China. But when they see this storm coming, there will be the equivalent of a bank run. That is, they will accelerate the process of moving their assets out of China. Uh, I've heard that in recent months, China's current account that actually began to show a deficit. There was a lot more money flowing out of China than flowing in, which might suggest actually some of them are getting very nervous about leadership transition because leadership transition may not lead to a democratic revolution in China, but leadership transition can lead to the loss of jobs of a lot of officials. And once you don't have jobs, you don't have political protection. And there economic wealth will be insecure. So they are now moving assets out. So I'm not personally surprised at all by these numbers. Well, and this is what's fascinating from a Western perspective, and it's certainly Western academics, the literature of today sees China's rise and its future ascendance 
as inevitable. This ascendance, you know, again, the economic progress of the last 20 to 30 years is taking them to an unparalleled position, ultimately surpassing that of the United States. Some people think that's 2030. Some people think that's 2050. But wouldn't you say, I mean, this is just to underscore many of the themes in our conversation today, that economic progress is necessary, but it's not sufficient to continue on a path of growth. And that, in fact, as we look back at the 21st century, we may not see the greatest superpower of the 21st century in the form of China. We may see one of the greatest missed opportunities because they were unwilling to reform politically. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think if you look at the predictions for the past 50 years, first the Soviet Union was supposed to pass the U.S., <laughs> surpass the U.S., then Japan, Neither of that panned out. And I would say that if China has not, if China fails to change politically and economically, it is unlikely it will sustain its economic growth or surpass the U.S. as the world's largest economy in the next 20 years. So I would say that making future predictions based on past trajectory is always a very hazardous business. And now, I have to say that the market is recognizing this. The market is becoming very, quite gloomy about China. That's because for the last five, seven years, the market has been very patient, waiting for the Chinese government to undertake the economic reforms that will sustain economic growth. But the market has seen very little of it. I've seen the Shanghai Exchange struggle to recover even half its losses from its peak a few years ago. And I think you're right. The number of major banks which took early stakes in China and have now pulled out their, and obviously the 2008-2009 time frame allowed them the excuse or justification to fortify their own balance sheet and get liquid with a number of non-core assets. But you're right. There has been a recognition in the market to some degree that China is not at the leading edge. I mean, it, we've seen other Asian countries where in the post-2008 period, we have seen a resurgence of growth. The Philippine stock market has been raging. It's not as if all of Asia is in the same boat, so to say, but the Shanghai exchange certainly has uh, been lagging significantly. Oh, yes. Yeah. I think Shanghai stock exchange is was at 6,000, 2007, and now it's uh, around 40%. It's uh, 2,400. So it's uh, internally, it's both investors inside China and outside China are becoming very pessimistic. Well, I just want to comment again on kind of the uniqueness of your contribution, because as I read economists, as I read whether it is Nicholas Lardy or Stefan Halper or many of your other commentators on China, very few are bringing in the political realities which ultimately do have a significant impact. And this is where we began our conversation today, is talking about political power being a critical element. You may have an economic roadmap, but it's ultimately going to be political power which determines the success of that endeavor or not. And, and you bring in that reality into the equation. I hope more academics pay attention to that because it, it seems that they'll be facing disappointment and uh, inexplicable set of circumstances for their ideas if they had assumed that all you need is a good plan and there is no execution risk. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. And I'm very appreciative of your emphasis on politics in ultimately determining economics. Well, if you were to look ahead, do you think that what we see in China today, do you believe that China will emerge from this global economic crisis, or do you think this is really the beginning of the end in terms of their potential story for greatness? Perhaps you think there's just too many X factors, unknown variables to say. Yeah, well, I would say that fundamentally China's economic growth is sustainable. Uh, it doesn't got to change course because the country still is at a level of economic development that has a lot of potential. It has very hardworking people. The private sector is very dynamic, even though today labor is under a lot of political constraints and economic disadvantages because of government policy in China. And China is so deeply connected with the rest of the world. So I would say fundamentally, I just don't see why China cannot grow at, say, 5%. 
a year, five or even six percent a year for the next ten, fifteen years. Given that China today is already a seven trillion dollar economy, that can make China a much richer country in the future. So economically, there's no reason to write off China. But of course, you always know this political but. They have to change the government from one that is solely interested in self enrichment to one that is interested in providing welfare to as many people as possible. And without changing a one-party state, can you do this? I'm very skeptical. So the trouble for China is that you have two transformations rolled into one, an economic transformation, uh, graduating from investment-led, state-dominated development model, that's one transformation, and another transformation is a transformation from a one-party system to a more democratic system. Can you accomplish this without revolution? A very big question for everybody. And I spend my waking hours thinking about this all the time. Well, you've given a great word picture contrasting these two alternative roles of the state. On the one hand, the grabbing hand. The grabbing hand is sort of the predatory state looking at getting what it can from the public. And the other is the helping hand. And perhaps that's what we need to see is that second transformation you were discussing. Well, Min Pei, thank you so much for joining us for our conversation today and the insights you've brought into a larger conversation, trying to understand the world we live in and determine perspicacious action. Where do we go from here uh, and what can we expect to see in terms of changes politically, geopolitically, economically, financially? We appreciate your contribution. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Well, David, if you could keep the political and the economic and the financial separated, it'd be much easier to do this. But we have to find how it interweaves. And, you know, it's funny. Minchin Pei said, what's politically desirable is not necessarily economically desirable. Well, and that's where you see the divergence. You've got the folks at the top who have an interest in the old way of doing things. The last 20 years of success has been a money-making machine for them. Not about to just hand that over to the hoi polloi. And, you know, that's to say there is an elite. They used to represent the hoi polloi, and right. now the elite is their own class in China. That has changed radically since 1979. Well, and I think it's fascinating. Michael Pattis last week talked about it. You talked about it the week before. And now Minchin Pei is talking about it. Repression of the citizenry. Okay, repression of the household by keeping interest rates unnaturally low. That's got to shift before they become a consumption-based society. Well, and fascinating, too, to look at the state-owned enterprises as a patronage machine where you've got them taking advantage of cheap capital and that being an additional tax on households, the equivalent of an extra 4 to 5% of GDP. We talked about corruption. We talked about how if they don't make this transition politically right. that allows for a real economic change, that they could be nationally bankrupt within five years. Now, with the change, he does see continued growth in China. Now, Pettis last week said that he saw over a 10-year period maybe an average of 3% growth per year. Minchin Pei is a little bit more optimistic. If they can have a change, he's looking at, you know, in the 5 6 7% range on growth. But certainly in question is this idea of an economic miracle and the point that Russia was considered the economic miracle of four or five decades ago. Right. Japan, the economic miracle of three decades ago. And now and bring China, on China, yeah. The, the current day economic miracle. And the, the verdict is still out. And I think the singular point, the greatest contribution from Minchin Pei in our conversation today, is that there are political issues which have to be addressed. It's not simply an economic plan that has to be devised, and that's where you're going to have the sticking spots. That's where it may not happen. And so that's what we're going to keep our eye on. Certainly we're interested in the outcome. We hope for a positive outcome, and we'll have to see. We certainly would never underestimate the Chinese. Very hardworking, as both of our past guests have mentioned, and very smart in terms of their perspective, looking at problems to solve over a 25, 30, 40, 50-year period. With a great deal of respect, we look forward to seeing if they can, in fact, get past these challenges, both economic and political. Well, you've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck, along with David McIlvaney, and our guest today, Min Chen Pei. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com, or give us a call anytime, 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio.
you should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.